Welcome back, everybody. Um, we uh, have another, another great presentation coming up. All of our presenters are coming up from the, uh, uh, coming to us from State University of New York, New Paltz. Jennifer Rutner, Senior Assistant Librarian. Uh, Nancy Campos, Program Director. Anthony Dandridge, Professor in the Department of Black Studies. Asalia Franklin Phipps, Assistant Professor in the Department of Educational Studies and Leadership. Uh, who will be here in spirit. <laughs> um, Adriana Martinez, research and education librarian, and Robin Sheridan, assistant professor in the Department of Educational Studies and Leadership. And they'll be speaking about libraries as a place of resistance, relationship-based anti-racist pedagogy. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. And... Um, Anthony is going to walk us through our agenda today. Peace family, hoping everybody is doing well. Thus far, I'm really enjoying this conference and I'm um, happy that we were all invited. Um, our agenda today has seven parts to it. Um, hopefully we'll get through all of them. We might have to hurry through some just as it relates to um, the ways in which we will be engaged in certain segments. But um, number one is the introduction. Number two, we'll be speaking about somatic work. Number three is an overview of the Sojourner Truth Library, Anti-Racist Campus Read. Um, number four will be a reflective writing. Um, number five is a roundtable discussion. And number six is, uh, un is understanding impact. We will end it with a uh, Q&A session. Um, it might be five minutes or less or longer, we'll see. And um, thank you very much. And um, Jen. Thanks, Anthony. So I wanna kick off um, this session in a similar way to how we ran the program. And I'll, I'll, we'll do a little overview of what the program was. But before we jump into all of this, um, you know, I just wanna ground what we're doing here in this space in somatic work, which I think is important. Um, and we, we all felt was important to incorporate into this program that we developed in that it's helping folks uh, especially in higher education, get out of our heads and into our bodies and start to think about the layers of experience that we have when we talk about different topics. I mean, really any topic and all, all of our ways of being in the world, um, but specifically when we're talking about anti-racism um, and specifically as white folks talking about anti-racism, trying to build this somatic awareness is, critical to the pedagogy that we used. So right now I'm gonna invite everyone to take a moment. Um, if you wanna turn off your camera for a minute and close your eyes, and wherever you're sitting, either on the floor, on a chair, maybe you're under your desk or in bed, right? So just feel where you're sitting. Um, I tend to always lean forward. So for these, I like to sit back and let my shoulders relax. And just start to notice your breath, right? There's nothing wrong with your breath. Let's mostly just be grateful that we're breathing. But we're gonna bring our attention inwards a little bit. And notice the sound, the quality of the breath. I'm a little sniffly today. We have allergies and Seasons changing on the East Coast right now. And then I want you to start to discern between the thoughts that we have in our heads, right? The constant chatter that we all hear, the feelings that we feel inside of us, and the sensations in our physical bodies. So thinking about where you are right now in this moment, I want you to notice one thought, one feeling, one sensation. And you might not have language to describe the feelings or sensations, that's okay. Just take a moment to recognize them, acknowledge them.
We'll take one more minute. Checking in with yourself. And when you're ready, you can slowly, gently open your eyes. If you want to turn your camera back on, you're welcome to come back into this space. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, using these tools, these very simple tools about mindfulness and, and connecting um, function to disrupt the over intellect intellectualization that we often find in academia and that many of us have been living in for our entire adult lives, right? And think about how that over intellectualization divorces us from our feelings and our bodily sensations, and that that is something that white supremacy thrives off of. So connecting to our different levels of experience, uh, consciousness and knowledge will help us disrupt deeply embedded learned patterns and move through difficult feelings while we're talking um, about racism and anti-racism. So now I'm going to introduce you to the program that we ran last spring, uh, spring 2021. So um, the name of our library on campus is the Sojourner Truth Library, and we proposed the uh, anti-racist -camp anti campus read program. Um, so this was a campus-wide program open to all staff, students, administration, literally anyone with a SUNY New Paltz um, email address could register. Uh, the program spanned four weeks in March. So we had each week, we had um, a synchronous session. We had a weekly reading. We had a reading and reflection guide that could be done asynchronously if folks can't attend the synchronous section. We gathered everyone via a Blackboard community um, and then also hosted weekly dis discussion boards on Blackboard. So given the nature of the global pandemic, I've, you know, we really wanted to make sure that folks could participate in ways that worked for them and weren't going to add additional stress. This is outside of the course loads that we're all working under. Um, it was an incredibly stressful year uh, last year for everyone, but we really, so we wanted to make engagement in this space um, possible. The library made a five-year commitment to running this program. So last year was our first year. We're gonna start planning the next year soon. <laughs> um, and I just wanna be really clear that um, this program was not designed as a training for white people or like a book club for everyone to come and kind of like get a little taste of something. Um, those, those things were very popular last year and we really wanted to find a way to differentiate this space and do something different. So our theme uh, for the program last year was the humanity and dehumanization of black people. And um, so each week we had a different theme and we, in weeks two, three, and four, we focused on a different um, text or body of work. So week one was kind of an orientation to anti-racism in higher education. And this is where we kind of brought folks in to this space and defined how we were going to interact um, in the context of anti-racist learning. Uh, week two was microaggressions in the embodied experience, uh, where we use the work of Claudia Rankin. Week three was systematized racism in the black body, and we read the work of Mark Lamont Hill. And week four, um, language, gender, race. And we focused on the work of Danez Smith. And I want to give a shout out to Asalia, who wasn't able to be here today, but she was really um, the one who selected these materials that gave us such an incredible foundation for the learning that we did. Okay, so who, who came <laughs> to the thing? We were like, if we don't get 30 people, I don't know if we can run this program. And we ended up having 161 people from campus registered um, and approximately 45 people attended each of the synchronous sessions. We really didn't 
keep measure, like take measurements of other ways of interaction. That wasn't really our focus at the time. So the majority of our participants um, were white. Uh, the breakdown by status was a lot of undergraduate students and a lot of faculty and instructors. Um, some of the folks on our steering group that you'll hear from actually required their classes to attend, so that was super helpful. Uh, most of the folks who attended are relatively new on campus. Um, that was one of the information points we were interested in. And, you know, we wanted to find a way to gauge people's engagement with this topic so far. And so most of our participants said that they had read somewhere between one and five books um, uh, related to anti-racism. Anthony, you wanna jump in? Yeah, gotcha. so yeah, um, as it relates to us uh, recruiting the steering group, it's important for us, everybody to understand that all of us are pre-tenure lecturers um, without a solid foundation or protection of tenure and a system that requires performative allyship and anti-racist work in a variety of different ways. As we attempt to navigate this tension, uh, we sought to establish a balance of engagement that does not reproduce the same kinds of harm and strategies that we were uh, seeking to shift in a particularly meaningful and uh, measurable way. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we also made involving students a priority and we were able to recruit some fantastic students who worked with us for a little bit of time um, during our planning process. And then because of the extraordinary circumstances of the pandemic, we're not able to stay on the program. So um, we're, you know, we're thinking about how to make this a more accessible uh, experience for the students because we really do want to center their, ex their experience, their thoughts, their perspectives in the work. Um, so I proposed this program and as a white person proposing a program about anti-racism in 2020, uh, I had a lot of thoughts and feelings about what I was doing, right? And how I was going to approach it. And so I wanted to kind of talk about some of the tensions that were in play that we've discussed. So one was being a white person running around campus asking, um, people of color to do more labor about anti-racism in 2020. Like that was didn't feel awesome <laughs> to me. And I was really self-conscious about it. And Anthony and I actually, we like worked through some things together and it was really helpful for me. Anthony's very involved on our, on our campus. And so I was kind of like, I don't know, maybe we should get somebody else. And then Anthony was like, I think it's my choice if I want to participate in this, please don't, you know, bypass me making assumptions about my labor and how I want to expend my energy, right? And I felt similarly about Nancy. Nancy's kind of a powerhouse on our campus. And I was like, oh, I don't want to ask you to do another thing, right? So that brings us into this like tension that I think a lot of us feel and that um, my colleagues of color here have expressed, right? This work cannot happen without people of color, but then it requires our labor um, in spaces that may reproduce harm, right? And I don't mean our, I mean on behalf of my colleagues. Um, so we had a lot of conversations about that and it, it really factored into the recruiting process and then how we moved forward in terms of team building. And then I'll say the last thing, um, about, sorry, um, oh, my role as the program coordinator, it see, I see that role as um, facilitating a positive experience for the other members of the steering group. So I wrote here, how can I make this an enriching experience and not a pain in the ass? Um, so nobody, you know, I'm going to take on all of the administrative work. This isn't a thing where somebody's going to be asked to put together a doodle and send it out to everybody by whatever, like I am taking on all of this so that the folks that I have brought into this program can do the interesting intellectual work. And that is their focus. 
But then as we um, talk about these uh, different ways in which we attempted to, let's say, uh, resisting uh, uh, performance, performativity, um, these ideas of black bodies versus black bodies of work. Um, our first bullet point speaks to uh, black text, spoke mm -hmm. to the black experience, shaping an authentic intellectual experience. Um, it's important as we start to understand this, we can look at it through a variety of different lenses. Uh, on one level, text as written or documented forms of expression and or communication as they are located in educational institutions in general tend to be grounded in empirical evidence, right? Experimentation and observation research, different things like that. Right? On another level, um, the use of text is also reflective of an acknowledgement of a quality of intellectual engagement that goes beyond the subjective. This idea of being reduced to the subjective experience is important in that subjectivity can be viewed as being limiting um, as it relates to issues of legitimacy uh, with respect to any particular field study or even talking about how the different ways in which we will value individuals. Right? Racism, and, this is, and um, this is particularly important because racism has in many ways isolated the humanity of Black folk to experience. Where science, where scientists knowledge production goes beyond experience and that is moved from the subjective experience to objective knowledge. Objective knowledge has been racialized in many measurable um, and racist ways. Um, that being said, black studies as a discipline is fully aware of this dehumanizing norm which still imposes obstacles to its legitimacy as a discipline and the, and the value in which um, black studies um, can similarly um, uh, be engaged by different levels of underdevelopment and exploitation, uh, which are racist norms reflective in this global marketplace of ideas and concepts that individuals that self-identify as being Black in this world experience um, these institutions, these disciplinary institutionalizations of these experiences of these individuals are marginalized as well. Um, in our anti-racist uh, campus read, uh, part of what we thought was that it was important for us to establish a productive balance that emphasized academic rigor while proceeding in a particularly humane orientation to the community which recognizes the value of those experiences. Nancy. So one of the things we were very conscious about is making sure we were not putting Black faculty and students in a position where they were having to perform. Um, meaning, you know, most of the time, Black people, people of color are asked to um, talk about their experiences, to talk about, you know, what is it like to be me? Um, where in this case, we use the text instead. So instead of having to, um, you know, talk from that kind of perspective, which a lot of people, that's what they're always asking for. That's what they want from us. Um, you know, that has been, especially in the last year, we've seen that all, you know, the panels and the different talks and all of that, they want us on display, um, which is very different here where we were very specifically engaging the text instead of putting ourselves out there. And that was a way for us to disrupt um, a lot of what was going on, right? So even through like book clubs and all of that kind of stuff, it's still in that sense of, you know, what do we think? How do we feel about these things rather than really focusing on um, using text in that kind of way? And so it was a very, a very intentional way to disrupt what we saw happening in higher ed everywhere um, and on our campus as well. Thank you. Okay, so um, many of us in the steering group um, reflected on how valuable the planning process was, not just, you know, the end goal, which was the program, the four weeks of programming, but the experience of building a relationship um, together. Um, we were attempting to create, uh, and we feel like we did create a different kind of ins uh, instructional space. Um, we all come from different um, instructional backgrounds. So some of us work in, in, in programming, some of us are uh, professors, some of us are, you know, librarians. So we all had uh, come into the space 
with different experiences, um, but all of us, many of us are tapped to do work on our campus that deals with um, anti-racism, anti-oppression. And so we were very intentional um, coming into the space about being clear on what we did not want to happen. Um, and the amount of you know committee work and classroom instruction um, that we take part in, we really uh, attempted to do something different here. Um, and building a relationship across our intellectual backgrounds, but also you know it, it mimicked the embodied pedagogy. We came into the space fully present. So our bodies um, and, and our experiences on our campus, because of course, again, this was you know part, and we still are here in this pandemic, but. Um, we were carrying a lot uh, coming into this space. Um, and we were not afraid, um, for the most part, to name the tension of what we have experienced on our campus when you know we're getting asked to do these panels or these trainings. Like Jennifer talked about, this is not a training for white people because, um, and, and I'm going to connect with what Nancy said, like the desire of the black body, the desire of people of color to tell their story so they can prove, you know, racism's real. We were very, um, you know, we held that tension in a delicate way in this space. Um, it was very important for us to deal with that tension, knowing that that tension ain't going away. Um, it is always there. Um, and we worked really hard in the planning process to be very conscious of that tension with, again, the goal of not being like, we're gonna pretend it's not there but being very clear on how we were going to navigate it. Um, and, you know, the false claim of anti-racism, the shit hadn't worked yet. Um, we, we all came in tired. Um, we're not going to lie. We were very tired. We still are very tired. Um, and this attempt not to repeat or perpetuate um, what constantly happens on our campuses, which is we are trying to challenge white supremacy, but white supremacy, you know, consumes um, so much. And, you know, we were very clear again in trying to just be in relationship. Um, this is where the pedagogical value, I think, for all of us was. We, we were learning through the planning process. It was a pedagogical um, process for us. Um, and that kind of connected to what ended up happening with um, the program itself. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Robin. So safety planning was an explicit part of the planning process and affected how we ran the program and the experience in the program. And so we wanna talk about that a little bit more. We used a number of tools um, in our safety planning. One is we made a safety plan. Two is we made guidelines, um, some of which you'll see later in the presentation for how we expected folks to show up in this space and what we felt was appropriate contribution and what we felt was not appropriate contribution. Um, we, you know, built in the tools, these somatic tools throughout to help people navigate their feelings and reactions uh, during the experience. And then I just want to point everyone to this um, tool that we used called the circle way. Some of you may be familiar with it. We didn't run the program as a circle, but um, one of their tools I learned from a colleague, um, Madeline Veitch, and I find it very powerful because it gives people a, an opportunity to say, hey, something doesn't feel right by asking for a pause. So that was really um, important to our work. I also want to say that, um, you know, this was a very community first uh, experience. That's why you see like our safety planning is grounded in um, the reality that we're a community and we are in relationship with each other. And that's the most valuable part of this um, learning experience. And I've also had a few people ask me like, oh, how did you learn to do all these different things, these different tools that you brought into the program, such as safety planning, like my boss asked me, you know, oh, like, where did you learn that? And actually, I learned that um, I'm a survivor of domestic abuse. And that is something that I've learned in therapy over the years is how to make safety plans. And I was able to bring that tool into um, this space. And I felt empowered to be like, no, no, we can set boundaries, we can set expectations, you know, we can shape this and say what we need, and what we want and what we don't want to happen in this space. And it was a really empowering experience. Adriana, did you want to add anything? 
I just wanted to say, and that tends to make me think about in library spaces and in higher education overall, we're not told how to navigate community without causing harm. Um, we are in these systems and spaces that are inherently racist and inherently harmful for a lot of our population, um, especially those that are on this, uh, this call and we're involved in this uh, community conversation. And we approach this as a community who have experienced harm in especially performative anti-racist spaces and in higher education. Um, so in terms of librarians and what they are meant to be in a part as a part of a community as resources and support without recognizing the harm that they are causing by using specific language and engaging with different uh, methodologies, it's important for us to remember that these are the ways that we can kind of engage with that and start doing the work that needs to be done. Thank you. Do you want to keep going with the reading and reflection guide? Sure, yeah, and uh, this is an example of one of the questions that were involved in our reading and reflection guide. Uh, it frames a lot more around how the individual is engaging with the work and with the conversation that needs to be happening, um, rather than framing it around um, exploiting someone else's uh, experience or that of those um, authors or the literature itself. It's internalizing and causing actual genuine reflection. So actually, I think instead of doing the reflective writing piece that we have on the next slide, which you'll be able to look at afterwards and maybe do on your own, what I'd like everyone to practice right now, everyone who's um, in the session is take a minute Maybe close your eyes, check in with your body, notice a sensation that you're feeling, maybe look at this list here to get you started, and then name a sensation that you're feeling in the chat and share it with all of us. Yeah, and if you have a word, um, a different word for your sensation, please add it to the list. This is just to get us going. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. This is awesome. Thank you. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's all take a deep breath and we'll jump into the next section. So we're gonna do a little bit of a round table discussion. I'm gonna facilitate the discussion um, between my colleagues here. Uh, so our first question that we're gonna talk about, it, hang on, I have to find where I am on my matrix. Okay, Anthony and Robin. Um, okay, so thinking about the program and the relationship-based anti-racist pedagogy. How did our relationship building contribute to the creation of an embodied anti-racist teaching and learning experience? I mean, I really loved it, right? But not a but. And um, I understand relationship building as life, right? Relationship building is life. So that's to say that an important aspect of being in the world and being human in the world is the creation and maintenance or even destruction of identities, ideals, and values, which are a reflection of the connections that we have to one another in this interconnected world, right? So some relationships will be prioritized and others may not be prioritized, but complementing this order of things uh, will be justifications for that order. So uh, within the context of the social construction of the ideas of race and racism, where it's asserted that one can look at an individual skin color by race. You look at an individual skin color and you can determine an individual's intelligence and morality just based upon their skin color, right? There's no significant grounding in evidence for that. But that's not to say that the assertion and 
uh, imposition of race and racism, um, irrespective of its validity, is not measurable, is not meaningful, and um, also is not manageable, right? Complementing this relationship building as an expression of the order of things is the sense of community that we try to establish that is created around those identities um, that inform varying, level, varying levels of trust and stability as it relates to the different identities. Uh, many times these identities, when we're talking about issues of race, gender, sexual orientation, um, being a faculty member, being a student, um, being a member of administration, right? all of these are identities. Human beings are complex, and we hold a lot of these identities as we walk through the world. And, and, and they are also imposed on us in a variety of different ways, too. They can cause conflict that, underman, that undermines um, how we view one another and also view our commonalities. So we intentionally engage these issues in a variety of different ways. In a variety of different ways, and I thought that it was um, particularly uh, productive. Riley? Yeah, I mean, you just said it all, Anthony, but um, I, I definitely feel like, um, you know, the part of, of thinking about our identities, we weren't just thinking, again, it was part of, you know, who we bring into these spaces, our bodies, and that's where the embodied part was so important. Um, most of the time, whenever we would meet as the steering committee, you know, we, we would do these somatic um, you know, exercises at the beginning to, to remind us like, hey, I know these academic spaces try to um, make us feel like our heads are apart from our bodies, but here we are full human beings in a space that frankly doesn't always treat um, us like full human beings, um, depending on who you are in that space and how that space frames you. And so I feel like the relationship building we did in that planning um, group really kind of, um, you know, spilled over into the program in some ways. I mean, even if, you know, the people who participated had their experience, we as a group who worked very hard to plan and be intentional, we were able to go into that space um, and not take on in our bodies some of the, you know, that toxic energy that happens um, often um, when we take part or try to challenge or resist, you know, in the academy, we were able to kind of build up through our relationships together um, so that we could go into that um, program, those four weeks in a particular, um, with a particular understanding of ourselves as full humans. Yeah, I'll add that, you know, I think it, the intentionality, the, the participation by all of us in the different sessions, even though we weren't the facilitators for every single session, I think that also was very important in that because then we served as the, I forgot what the roles were, but you know, basically protecting the chat and making sure um, you know, that we were, we were watching to see what was happening. And then I think also not just the planning, but the debrief after every single one of those. And in a very particular, in a, in a very specific time where we were being asked to do so much in other ways that were very harmful, but to be able to go into the space, feel like we had a group of people who were, who were there for us, and then being able to talk through any of that tension at the end of each of the sessions, I think, you know, really helped to build that, that kind of relationship amongst ourselves, because I don't think that that part wasn't intentional. That was something that just happened after every single one and it was a very natural thing um so i think that was also very important great thank you so our next topic interdisciplinary anti-racist teaching in the librarian experience um so how did the interdisciplinary nature of this program and the collaboration with librarians help shape the program I like to start off um, addressing this question just by centering the idea of interdiscipl interdisciplinarity. Um, interdisciplinarity is an approach to the production of knowledge which prioritizes the combining of traditional branches of knowledge in ways that provide new insights and outcomes and our methods that impact the production of knowledge in our social natural environment. At its base, interdisciplinary is um, an acknowledgement of the complexity of the human world and by extension, the complexity of the natural world on a variety of different levels. In short, as there are the necessary construction of boundaries um, that complement the maintenance of disciplinary formation, 
to the extent that we can identify, compartmentalize, and talk about physics, chemistry, biology, geology, astrology, anthropology, economics, history, poli sci, psychology, sociology, and so on, right? Um, natural sciences and social sciences, right? There are also ways for us to understand the reality that these objects of inquiry are not isolated from one another in any strict way, that um, asserts these objects of this disciplinary inquiry um, do, um, that they don't interact, right? So if we understand that they do interact in the real world, then our understanding of them in our production of knowledge and, um, acknowledges that their interaction in part by the creation and maintenance of spaces for us to do interdisciplinary work um, is particularly important. Um, Black studies as a discipline is inherently interdisciplinary as it attempts to engage the complex totality of the experiences of people of African descent. Uh, within Black studies, you're talking about Black psychology, Black philosophy, Black history, so on and so forth, all these different topics, right? Um, and if we uh, readily admit the systemic nature of racism, then by default, we understand its opposite, anti-racism, and um, must intensely engage these, uh, the complexity of this phenomena in a variety of different ways. So subsequently, this engagement will be located in a variety of different institutions, languages, cultures, disciplines, um, and different fields of study and so on. So libraries as institutionalized social constructions are part of this complex world that contribute to the social production of knowledge and are part and, I, and are in part uh, reflective of our biases, values, and identities. Um, Nancy. Adriana, you wanna share anything here? Yeah. Sure, yeah. I think that that's inherently an, an important part of the way that we need to have conversations about the role of libraries especially in, in higher ed and academia, right? When we think about how we teach uh, research methods and the way that we have conversations around uh, engaging with the community uh, at large about each of the disciplines that students or, or faculty or community members might be engaging with and are a part of, it's important for us to acknowledge that, that academic libraries inherently contribute to white supremacy in the academy by reproducing these same methodologies instead of embracing systemically, right, systemically embracing the kinds of conversations that Anthony is mentioning that occurred in Black studies and have systemically changed and make Black studies in the way that that functions and the way that that conversation can happen needs to occur in in higher education especially in libraries as a focal point for collaboration um or at least the way that we say it is a focal point for collaboration uh this needs to be embraced in order for us to do work that is not reproducing and reappropriating and extractative of our our community members of color thank you so much all right, library instruction is not classroom instruction. So this was some of my favorite feedback to get from my colleagues. So as an instructor, what did you notice about teaching through or with the library in comparison with your typical classroom experience? So for me, for the, um, as we work in the Sojourner Truth Library Anti-Racist Campus Read, um, I actually had my entire course attend for the four week event. Uh, the name of the course is Contemporary Issues of African American Community. Um, we would do the reading for the week, attend the campus read online, and then meet online afterwards. Remember, this is the pandemic was going on in September, right? so everything was online. Right? Much of the classroom content, um, uh, which uh, followed the Sojourner Truth uh, Anti Racist Campus Read, was spent on engaging the material from that particular um, campus read. Um, what I found was that students who were, they were really motivated by having additional voices and practices included in their course. Right? I've been teaching higher education for 21 years, and let's say for the last 15 years, I start off every class each time when we meet um, with a practice of saying, is everybody all right? Is anybody not all right? Is, any, is, there, is there anything that has occurred in your personal life or the, or the public sphere since last class that you would like to share? That's how I start off every class, every time we meet. Um, that practice does a variety of different things, but it relates to, uh, to us um, attempting in different ways in which we want to attempt and maintain an anti-racist framework. 
that my case is rooted in Afrocentric me methodology. I'm an Afrocentric, right? Um, that informs this pedagogy by acknowledging that the professor is charged with certain fiduciary responsibilities, but is, but is merely the facilitator of knowledge upon which we have all agreed to engage um, and not to the exclusive custodian. Uh, the professor is not the exclusive custodian of this knowledge as our students uh, have meaningful and productive contributions to, to make to this educational journey. So I always try to minimize the distance between myself and my students, and that is one practice that attempts to do that. So um, as I try to create safer spaces for the production of um, and exchange of knowledge in these places that are grounded in critical reflection, uh, one of the most in, indefatigable uh, marginalizing issues on this planet um, is race and racism. And um, uh, we try to create spaces in which our students feel welcome. And the, um, this particular um, uh, uh, four week uh, program that we participated in um, uh, supply, uh, provided them with a variety of different uh, alternative instruction and also alternative ways to participate. Yeah. I also just wanna chime in that one thing that is very notably different between this space was that um, it was majority not students, right? And so we were navigating a huge power differential in that space and trying to stay focused on the students. The majority of the students who were participating um, were people of color and black folks. And so we we had a lot of white administration and you know our black and people, you know, students of color. Uh, and that we were very conscious of that um, and how to navigate that and how to be direct about who we're prioritizing and whose safety we're prioritizing in that space. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. Uh, thank yeah. you for that. Oh, oh. No, Nancy, you go. Uh, oh, um, so I come in to this space in a very different, from a different perspective because I am a program director. I work primarily with students of color, which I think is very different of an experience than everyone else, like faculty in general on our campus at a PWI. I'm one of three program directors on campus that run programs for students of color. Mine is specifically in science and engineering. Um, and, you know, last year trying to continue to have these kind of conversations from that perspective, bringing my students together to have conversations about what does it mean, you know, for them um, in this moment, it, it was very different than coming into the space where also I had just gotten my PhD last summer and that was announced to everybody and so, you know, um, I was asked to do a lot of things because here we were needing people, people of color, people who did this work, um, people who weren't valued before. My program has never been as valued as all of a sudden it was last year. And so we were being asked to do a lot. My students were being asked to do a lot. Um, and so coming into this space and what it looked like to use my my experience as somebody who's done research, who, you know, who, who has taught, who has done this work in a very particular way, who then also works specifically with students of color as an advocate, but also helping them figure out how to advocate for themselves. Um, this was a different experience to be able to kind of blend those two things and to have people see me in a different way, right? I'm not just the director who's always complaining on behalf of my students and trying to get the campus, the administration, faculty to understand these things, you know, but to have people realize like, I know what I'm talking about. I know, you know, just like faculty do, um, you know, just like faculty feel like they are experts and what they do, I, I do have that expertise. And to me, that was very valuable. Um, you know, to come into the space and for the library specifically to do that, because the library, I feel, is such an important space on campus that is used in this way, that can be used in this way. And to use it, um, to see that come out of this was a, a really great experience. And to see my students participate as well was also um, great. 
Okay, we're gonna move on to the last one. Thank you so much. So safer spaces for black students and faculty. How did safety planning impact your personal experience on the steering group, as well as your experience teaching in the program? Gotcha. So um, I see we're getting a little short on time, so I'll keep it a little okay. um, um, Being black in America means that you tend to be overburdened and, un and undervalued. It's like being the only black student in the class, and this can be particularly traumatic, and that many times you are looked at as, um, as if you should represent all black folk at all times, but also to be an expert on content in a way that your peers may not be an expert. Right? So some people are more or less comfortable with these conditions, but even outside of participation, like speaking up and getting involved, one's presence can be viewed as by black folk as carrying um, obligations to speak up and get involved. Martin Luther King once said, uh, quote, um, in the end, you will not remember the words of your enemies, but the silence of your friends. To that extent, your silence matters. And not speaking on certain issues um, can be seen as being particularly problematic and can even be traumatizing by black folk, black students, right? Black, even black faculty. And that can compel individuals not to even show up at events because they don't wanna be that one black person again, right? So we try to create safer spaces for people to participate in or simply just observe. And I'll say, you know, again, from the, the context from which I work from, you know, being able to see students engaging with the material, um, participating in, in these conversations in a way that was safe, that was that I knew that they weren't being put on display, that they weren't being asked to, you know, explain to white faculty, white administrators, why racism is bad like i mean you know i feel like that's that's a lot of what we ask our our black students in particular to do and that was very important to me to see that to to see it in action to see that they were they weren't they were active participants they were able to participate in a way that felt okay to them and i think one of the the telling things um, was in the survey, a lot of the students wanted to have more of that kind of conversation amongst the participants, which we tried to limit for a very specific reason, but realizing that they, they were asking for that because they did feel very safe. They felt like they were going to be able to, um, to express themselves in the same way that we were able to do, not realizing that we had controlled so much of this entire experience so that it wouldn't end up in the same way as many of the other um, programming activities, events that we had seen happen throughout the year. And then, you know, really seeing how in the same way that we, that I do that for my program and a lot of the, um, the programming we had done last year was around that same kind of thing, building that safe space um, for our students to feel like they could be there and just be. Um, it was really important to see a campus-wide event do the same kind of thing and have that same kind of model, I think is important for, for the students, um, for faculty also, because hopefully faculty were able to take something away from that and realize, you know, they can build these spaces as well in their classrooms. Thank you. Okay, so understanding outcomes. So now that it's been about six months since this wrapped, we've all kind of been like, oh, what? What happened there? <laughs> we really enjoyed this. What what happened though? So Adriana. Yeah, so we have obviously from <laughs> throughout the presentation, we've been talking a little bit more about the challenges and the kind of realities of these kinds of programs, right? We were talking about, you know, Robin had mentioned how we are tired. Like this is something that we, you know, a lot of us do doing all the time, especially Nancy and other people on campus are in terms of our, our number four infrastructure, thinking about people that are on campus that have been doing this work for, for many, many years. This is not new, right? It is, this is a very clear, especially on our campus, this is not new because we can lean on so many incredible people that have been doing this work for a very long time, but those people continue to be kind of overlooked and continue to be under-resourced that Nancy had kind of briefly mentioned, right? Um, 
so a program like this is not going to change those structural pieces, right? It can lift up the work that they're doing, but realistically, you know, it has, we have to think about our way that we can make those in, impacts, right? Um, another part of that is thinking about sustainability um, and, and kind of recruitment, like how can we reach out and build a growing community of people that are continuing to do that work um, and are interested in having the kind of two-year commitment that we have for our steering group are able to sustain that and continue to have these conversations. Um, yeah, I, I'm, we hope that this is something that can continue in a way that never feels extractive and never feels like we have people in our, you know, participants that are going to do things that challenge our safety measures. Um, this semester, well, this year, rather, we were very lucky in that I think also not just luck, but also strategic and done a lot of work around making sure that this was a safe space that would continue to be so. And I think that's sustainable, absolutely. Um, but we have to think when we think a little bit larger about how, you know, is anti-racism possible in a specifically neoliberal context that is higher education in, you know, the state of New York or in whatever, you know, state run or private run institution of higher education. Right. What can that look like and what lines do we have to draw in between what needs to have what can happen here and what needs to go beyond these higher education spaces. Um, if Asalia was here, that is something she would absolutely be talking about much, much more and has an incredible insight about. Um, but I will say that the concept of doing anti-racism beyond the uh, individual action or being in a classroom and doing that individually is specific, specifically not sustainable, right? Like it needs to become a praxis, a part of the way that people function and, and think and work. Um, so those are the, <laughs> the very large challenges, um, but we can now move into impact. Right, so yeah, I just like to say, we definitely have large challenges. Um, uh, and as I evaluate the impact, so I'm an Afrocentrist, right? And even the, I, the language that you see in a lot of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, um, they talk about centering these individuals, centering that, that, act, that word evolved from Afrocentricity, right? It means to center one um, experiences, center oneself within the experiences of people of African descent, right? So let's say, as opposed to me quoting um, John F. Kennedy, I might quote Martin Luther King, different things like that. That being said, um, um, the land, um, I walk through the world, Afrocentrists tend to walk through the world with a victorious consciousness. Um, so to that extent, we understand that the small things count. Um, one thing I like to do as I'm start, as I understand, let's say, and what we call a holistic worldview, or let's say an, an Afrocentric worldview, um, we need to understand the significance of the small things. So, I mean, some people may have heard of the starfish story. Let me just recite it real quick. I know we're short on time, but it's gonna take 30 seconds, right? The starfish story is out there, been, been on the internet for a long time, but here it is, the starfish story. Uh, one day a man was walking along the beach when he noticed a boy picking something up and gently throwing it into the ocean. Approached the boy, he asked, what are you doing? The youth reply, replied, throwing starfish back into the ocean. The surf is up and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they'll die. The son said, um, um, the man said, son, you, don't you realize there are miles and miles of beach and hundreds of starfish? You can't make a difference, right? After listening politely, the boy bent down, picked up another starfish, and he threw it back into the surf. And then he smiled at the man. And he said, I made a difference for that. The point is the small things count and are very meaningful. Systems don't, are not radically changed overnight. Right, right? We change, it's a process. So everything that we are doing is not only benefiting us as individuals, it's honoring our ancestors, but also benefiting those yet unborn. And as we start to understand the interdependence of our reality, we, we also understand that all the things we do have meaning as, as we move through this world. So it's, it's, there's one phrase that I like to say a lot of times is, um, we can't be all things to all people, but everything we do and don't do impacts all people at all times. 
So the fact that you're sitting here at this conference is shaping this conference in a variety of different ways, but also the fact that you are not home right now with a loved one, not taking care of your uh, parents, not, not at a different job, making more money, not all, this, all, the, all those other knots, right? It's shaping the world also. All of this stuff is connected, right? And that speaks to the idea of interdisciplinarity and different things like that. That being said, um, I walk through the world as an Afrocentrist, we walk through the world with a victorious concept. So what is the impact? The impact is, is particularly meaningful. Thank you so much. And then this is just my last um, contribution as the program coordinator and the person who proposed this program, the only measure of success that I have kept in mind throughout this entire experience is my relationship with the other folks on the steering group. Um, not only would there not be a program without their contributions, but that that is the most valuable thing to me. And the fact that everybody is like, we're, we're still in it together. We're on the same team. Um, after that, you know, year long experience, uh, I just feel so grateful and I feel, you know, a measure of success. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick Q and A. Adriana Robin is going to tell us about our participation guidelines. Yes, and these are the guidelines that we used in our synchronous sessions, um, and we will use them here. So, um, just for for those of you um, who have questions, to consider what is my positionality and the power dynamics within this community, and am I exercising caution? Um, especially depending on um, who you are in this space. Um, you could ask yourself, is, is what I am contributing necessary to discuss in public and or related to this presentation is my response and immediate reaction to feelings of discomfort, which is very important to consider before posing that question. And, um, you know, because questions take up space and this is kind of why these guidelines are here. Am I furthering the discussion in a productive way? Um, and we invite participants to practice building skills that interrupt common racist language and ideas. Um, and so we note that these guidelines are adapted from the work of Eve Tuck, who is associate professor at the University of Toronto. And then I believe the conference um, has their uh, own, yeah, way of asking yeah, that, questions. We so, didn't know yeah. that Corliss was gonna be so amazing and do all the things. So thank you, Corliss. <laughs> well, it isn't Corliss doing all the things, but thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, one question that was asked is whether you'll be able to share uh, your sources for learning embodied pedagogy. Um, if you have some way of sharing that, or I, I don't know if you've got- um, a, There are some links in the slides. So okay. um, when we share the slides out- Great. To yeah, everyone there, we'll and uh, similarly, um, you know, uh, people are um, in awe of the program and they wanna know, is there some, do you have a website or a LibGuide or some, place where we can learn more about it since it was in um, um, Blackboard, I think it was. Yes. I will put a link in the chat. It's also in the linked from the slides. Great. I got it, Jen. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. We move at the same speed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, and since it's a multi-year project, will you be doing a post assessment as well? I don't know. And I used to be an assessment librarian. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate your honesty. <laughs> um, and did you ever have any, well, were there, there must have been some awkward moments when you had, say, administrators um, being administrators, <laughs> maybe not um, respecting um, the relationship building and relate, re respecting the, the power dynamics. Is there a way to handle that that you are willing to talk about in public? <laughs> so I thought maybe I'll go first. Um, I think that the way that we set expectations for how people were to engage in the space mm -hmm. worked. And we, yeah. you know, we we brainstormed every yeah. every possible terrible scenario that we have either lived through or witnessed or anticipate <laughs> based on um, you know the relationships on our campus and 
you know, we, we've all been in those meetings and we really worked hard to set a different tone. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know, I think just the act of saying the things like we are prioritizing the safety of our black lecturers and facilitators and our black students mm -hmm. and saying things like, are you furthering the discussion in a productive way? And one of the things with the reflective writing like that we were gonna do, but I skipped it. Um, you do reflective writing and then you keep it to yourself. Mm. This isn't show and tell. This isn't a place for people to say every single experience they've ever had with racism on either side, you know, but specifically with white folks saying, well, this happened to me one time. Um, the, it, we weren't inviting that in very clearly. Um, and I think it did shift and uh, that is all I am going to say right now. <laughs> okay. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we, we don't have time for many questions, but somebody did ask, uh, you, you got uh, an impressive number of people to show up. How did you market the program? And, and how did you, you know, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's amazing that so many people signed up. What's amazing is people showed up. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we can't actually mark, like uh, email directly to the students. So mm -hmm. we were only able to promote it to faculty um, and staff on campus. And then we encouraged faculty to invite their students. Um, and that worked pretty well. We saw, I mean, we exceeded our expectations beyond. And I think part of it was, you know, the moment that we were in. I'm interested to see what happens this year. Hopefully we will have more faculty who make space for this in their syllabi and incorporate it into the class and we can bring more students in that way you know we'll see what happens on the faculty staff administration side if they have time for this this year i can i also add i think part of it too was the the steering group like who brought in you know who mm -hmm. i think the fact that we were very strategic about choosing who part who was part of that group you know, for me, it was interesting to see so many science and engineering faculty who hardly ever I see, I never see them at stuff. Um, but I, you know, my name was on there. I sent it out to them and it was really clear that they signed up because I was clear that I was participating. So I think, you know, in that way, in the same way that my students signed up because they knew I was, um, you know, participating, and I know other people did the same, and I think it, it's true of all the the um, the members of the steering group that everybody kind of pulled in different people um, because of all the things that we do on campus already. I agree. And Can I, we I, mm -hmm. keep going, please? I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, to, uh, you know, I was new to SUNY New Paltz by a few months when we started the planning process for this uh, for this program. And I think that uh, to just reiterate and, and compound on what Nancy was saying about the, the community that we've created from the steering group and the people that trust those us to have that conversation and be very real and do the work of creating all of these safe spaces and those different precautions absolutely will build a special kind of community around the read as it continues through its years, which I think will be more than a measurable value uh, for us as people of color on campus and also in general um, on the on campus. Um, and I will you forgive me if I ask one more keep you keep you a little late this one is popular. Um, Anthony, when you do your is everybody all right is anybody not all right check in with students, do you ever share when you are not all right uh, and the ask the person who asks her, she struggles to whether to do that with the multi ethnic multi abled library team that she manages. When is it appropriate and when is it oversharing or selfish. Um, do you have any thoughts about that. Um, I never look at it as being selfish because I, I attempt to model ways of engaging for my students. So I always share when I'm not all right, whether it's just physical issues, um, stuff that's going on on campus. There was a statue that was put up this on, on campus this year, the Black Studies 
department currently, right now, as we speak in this uh, in this uh, venue, is protesting that statute. The the uh, administration put out an apology. Now we're having dialogue around that particular issue. So um, all of those issues I bring into the classroom, talk about certain things like that, um, um, as a way to also um, humanize myself, but mm -hmm. also, and also model it so they can get involved and share what they think as well. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for sending us out with victorious consciousness. I'm, I'm, I love that. Um, and um, <laughs> you've given us you've given us so much to think about. Um, we're going to break for lunch now. And um, as it says in the chat, um, you're welcome to stay in the Zoom link. Um, and uh, or, or, or not. Um, if you are staying in the Zoom link, we're going to put you in the wait room. Nothing personal. We've got backstage magic to make happen. Um, so um, you can come back a few minutes before one o'clock for more terrific presentations. The evaluation form, if you need to leave, is on the screen. And our hashtag is LaukaB2021. So expect to see some terrific tweets out there. Um, thank you again, everybody, and see you back at one.